But this evening, really, we're here to uh, recognize the achievements of, of somebody very special. And uh, in 2011, uh, we introduced a Lifetime Achievement Award, recognizing success um, and influence on European golf. And uh, some past winners of that have been Nick Faldo, Bernard Langer, Bernard Gallagher, Alison Nicholas, Tony Jacklin, and in the first year, and probably the reason that we introduced this award, we were able to honor the great Sevi Ballesteros, and obviously a, a great, great friend uh, of our guest this evening. So this year's recipient, um, I'd like to just call upon our president, uh, George O'Grady, and also one of our directors, Ken Schofield, to uh, present this year's uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. I've not got a lot of room on this stage, so I'll step off when you come up. Um, but this year's winner, two times Masters champion, 1994 and 1999. I believe, if I've got the facts right, 30, time, 30 professional wins worldwide. Um, seven times Ryder Cup player, um, and uh, including having the most successful partnership in Ryder Cup history with uh, with Seve, believe played 15 matches, won 11, half two, and only lost two. Just, I think, an incredible driving force in taking European golf and the success of the Ryder Cup to, to where it is now. And now, also involved in designing two more great golf courses uh, here at uh, Costa Navarino. And of course, it would be wrong not to mention the miracle at Medina. What an amazing last 24 hours we had we had there and uh, the successful captaincy. So uh, without further ado, this year's recipient of our lifetime achievement is Jose Maria Alathabal. Do you want me to go up? Thank you. That's perfect. All right. I'm going to ask Ken to, uh, to stay on stage because as well as being our director, past president, um, 30 years in charge of the European tour, he is now more famous in America for being a <laughs> pundit on the Golf Channel. And so who better to conduct the Q&A because he's spent many, many years with Jose Maria. So uh, Ken, we're looking forward to this next session. I'll hand All over right. to you very appropriate that we have a wonderful uh, turnout here this evening. Uh, what can I add to what Ian has expertly said? I think we all know it's very, very seldom in our lives we get to sit with one of the greatest golfers of any time and certainly of our time. Jose Maria, we know what you have done. It's in the record books. But I think all of us here have been your fans for all of your career. We continue to be. And I think we should start at the very beginning. We know you're a brilliant amateur, and we'll come on to yeah. that before your professional career. But tell us when you started. First time, maybe you had a golf club in your hand. I was a little baby. I was, uh, I was just, uh, you know, uh, 14 months old. Um, uh, the thing is that when I was born and raised, it was a farm, and um, we didn't own the land. Uh, uh, the landlord obviously did, and uh, there was a, a small uh, nine-hole golf course uh, not far away uh, from our farm, maybe half an hour drive uh, in those days, and uh, they were very limited. Uh, in a space, and they could, they wanted to enlarge the the golf course to to 18, and didn't have the the space. Uh, so they they started looking to uh, um, uh, places where they could build 18 holes, and they came up uh, to uh, to this spot. Uh, they talked to uh, to the owner, and uh, uh, the owner sold the land uh, to build the, the golf course uh, under one condition that every family that worked the land uh, in those days would have a place to work uh, uh, on the golf course or the clubhouse. And uh, funny enough, my uh, my mom uh, put the first the first nine flags on on the front nine, 
and uh, I was born the following uh, day. So that's uh, that's uh, how uh, close I was to the to the, to the game of golf and, and to the golf course. And um, obviously, when I was able to uh, to start walking, uh, my father actually my grandfather was a greenkeeper. My father worked on the golf course, and and they managed to find balls. And uh, somebody uh, gave a, a putter to to my father. And obviously the putter was much bigger than I was, uh, and they had to uh, cut uh, the putter halfway down the shaft, and they put some uh, tape on top of it, so I didn't, I didn't get myself cut with the edge of the, of the shaft, and uh, that's how I started uh, playing golf. When did you know, or when did your parents perhaps know, that you were going to become an elite player and a great champion? Well, to be honest, I never thought I would become an elite player. Uh, the thing is that uh, I, I played the game because I loved it. I had a great time uh, playing it. Uh, that gave me the opportunity to play uh, against other kids. Uh, uh, when I was uh, six, seven, eight years old, I started to play uh, the Spanish championships under those uh, ages, and uh, I was able to to go to uh, Malaga, by instance, and Torre Quebrada, and those places, and, and play with uh, kids uh, uh, my age. And I did well. Uh, and then you know, I kept on playing golf uh, without thinking too much about the future, to be honest. Uh, I was having a great time uh, playing golf. And uh, when I started playing international golf, the uh, first uh, time I did so was when I was 14 years old. We played the Spanish uh, a match uh, between uh, France and Spain in Po. Uh, and that was my first time I, I left uh, the country and uh, I started playing international competitions uh, and again I you know kept on doing uh, quite well. Uh, Better than that I well, think. You know, I, international I successes win, well, in Italy. I managed to win a few events. And, and uh, we must ask you about one in particular because yeah. by the time you came uh, to the United Kingdom yeah. I think you had and we have David Rickman here from headquarters, but I think you started winning big time in RNA's major youths, yes. boys, championships, yeah. and then finally in 1984, you became the amateur champion at yeah. Formby. At Formby, yeah. Beating a gentleman that you play, were to play with <laughs> and against for the better part of the next 25 years. Yes, true. I think everybody in this room knows of Colin Montgomery. And we want to ask Cozy, don't we? Did Colin act well when, <laughs> when he had to shake your hand, losing five and four? His face was kind of red. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, it, was, uh, it was an extraordinary day. Um, I remember I barely managed to win my first couple of matches uh, yes. uh, early in the week uh, and f somehow managed to get to the final. And I have to say that uh, that final day was... Uh, it was amazing. Um, you know, I, I did all kind of things to Monty, to be honest. I mean, he was really, he, he will always uh, remind me of, those, of that day, you know, whenever we talk about it. Uh, by instance, uh, I know I chipped in like twice. Uh, I didn't make paths from everywhere. But there was an incident where, um, I, if I remember properly, I think it was the 10th hole. It was a short par four. And the green is actually surrounded by a big a slope, and the, and the people were, you know, on top of the slope and all that. And he was uh, first to play the second shot, and we couldn't see the green surface, but we could see the flag. And he hit. It must have been like a wedge, something like that. It was not. It was not a long club, and the ball uh, took off really well. Uh, same shape as he always did afterwards, with a little fade and uh, the ball looked really beautiful and ball we saw the ball bouncing and all of a sudden the, the crowd went crazy you know wow and i said well bloody hell that's really close <laughs> so, so i was next to him and i took the wedge and i hit a lovely shot and all of a sudden uh, people went even crazier you know and actually i hold the shot and hold you know, it yeah. <laughs> and his, his ball was like a oh. foot from the hole you know? <laughs> so, uh, it, was, it was one of those days that uh, everything went my way and uh, even though he played uh, really good golf, uh, you know, I came up on, on top and 
Yeah, great, great win to have, yeah. Well, that was the pinnacle of the amateur game, and of course a year later yeah. you decided to embark on your touring career, and you arrived in La Manga, didn't you, yes. for the 85 qualifying school? And uh, I just wondered if you had nerves on arrival, because the record books would indicate that maybe you didn't, because you <laughs> led from first to last. Um, I have to say that at that time, uh, my game was really sharp. Uh, I was really feeling comfortable with my game. Uh, La Manga, even though in those days we were using, obviously, the Valata balls and, yeah. and the wooden drivers, it was not uh, such a long off course. And uh, uh, in that regard, it, it suited my game, uh, you know, with, with pretty fast greens, uh, well protected, and my iron play was really good. So uh, I felt comfortable uh, yeah. from the very beginning. Uh, playing those two golf courses, south and north. And uh, um, it's true that I started really well, uh, but uh, when you play for the, for the Q school, uh, you know, it's a long week. I mean, it's, it's not a normal event six where you rounds. play correct, where you play uh, four rounds, uh, you know, it's six rounds. Uh, there is a lot of things that, go, uh, that can go wrong. But, uh, um, you know, as I said, I felt really comfortable and, um, you know, I was putting really well and uh, I managed to, uh, to win this, uh, the Q School. Uh. So on tour, and within eight months, yeah. first big win yeah. up in Krongsusea. Correct. And that, as Ian said, the first of over 30 international wins. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the first win and the feelings. Um, before that, I have to say that I had a couple of chances where, uh, where I could... Uh, uh, win my first event and uh, uh, for different reasons, sometimes because I missed a uh, couple of shots down the stretch or because of or the opponents uh, made the good birdies I didn't manage and, and you start, you know, uh, those things start, start to play uh, games on, on your head, no? And uh, um, I remember very vividly uh, the last couple of holes uh, when I had a couple of uh, shots uh, cushion and uh, I have to be honest, I was really very nervous uh, and when I was standing on the 18th tee, uh, somehow I just wanted to, to keep that ball on the fairway and I really teed really, really low <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I crunched one down there with, with a divot <laughs> and everything off the tee but I managed to keep it in play and I remember that uh, uh, for my second shot, even though it's an elevated golf course as, as you all know, I had a, quite a decent uh, distance. Uh, uh, it was like 130, almost 140 yards, and and uh, my caddy said, "Well, it's, it's a perfect distance for a wedge." And I said, "Listen, <laughs> with the adrenaline flow that I have right now, <laughs> I'm not hitting a wedge here, no chance. <laughs> so give me the sand wedge." And uh, and I hit the sand wedge, and, and he never thought I would be able to really get the ball anywhere pin high, pin high, but actually. I hit it uh, so well, and with adrenaline flow, uh, you know, I put it uh, pin high, made two pass to win. But I have to say that as hard I was trying to breathe in air, you know, and I do have quite a big nose. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was. I was finding it hard to to breathe in. Yeah. What you're really confirming is what all of us think: it's very, very hard to win. It is hard to win. And yes. you have won so many, many times now. I think many of us now want to go a year forward to your first mm -hmm. Ryder Cup match, the historic first away win by the European Ryder Cup team mm -hmm. in the United States at Muirfield Village, the start of your partnership with, with Seve. And uh, in Wikipedia, in the Googling, it says that with two putts to win your first match together, from about 14 feet, it is suggesting that Seve putted 10 feet yeah. past. Now, tell me it was not 10 feet, Jose. It was, he hit it past a good seven, eight feet past the hole, but actually he hit it from closer distance. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't 14 feet. It wasn't feet. 14 feet. Wasn't 14 feet. <laughs> <laughs> we have to update Google. This was <laughs> the great <laughs> Seve. Yeah, that was Seve, yeah. Uh, it's true that we were playing foursomes and uh, um, I hit that fairway and he was uh, 
uh, having doubts between uh, a solid five iron and a cut four iron on two. The flag was really short left and the green actually is facing you um, uh, from front to back uh, and the greens were extremely quick that week. I uh, have to say that uh, uh, for uh, any of us Europeans to, to putt in those greens that week, it was, it was a real challenge. I mean, we were not used to, to that kind of a speed. It must have been close to 13 uh, on the steam meet. And, uh, well, he decided to go with a, with a cut shot with a four iron and actually pull it left. <laughs> and obviously the ball went long into the second bunker by the green. And I had a, a kind of a very tricky bunker shot. Uh, uh, I was just past the hole, but the green ran away uh, and from left to right and had to aim to the left edge of the green as I was playing, which was a straight uh, past the flag about uh, 30 feet to the very edge of the green. So I hit a lovely bunker shot and the ball took the, took the slope and ended up, I would say, I promise you, n no more than eight feet, it nine says, feet. Yeah. Jose, it says so, 14 feet yeah, in know, Wikipedia. Well, well you, just, you just look, look, <laughs> look at the videos and I tell you, there's no 14 feet in there. And, uh, and the greens were so quick that uh, obviously we needed actually two putts to win because the Americans uh, were uh, short with the second shot, daft the chip, uh, second chip actually was uh, given, it, it was, it, they made five. And uh, we needed, we were one up and we needed two putts to win. And we looked at the break, you know, Sevi was bent over, you know, I was just over his shoulder. And we kept on looking at the break and there was not much on it. It was, you know, pretty much a straight, if anything, a touch right to left. And I said to Sevi, Sevi, I mean, the greens are so fast. There is no chance you can leave it short. All you have to do is just put the ball in motion. And I promise you, you know, you, you know, we're going to make two putts, no problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, don't you worry, don't you worry. Okay. <laughs> so so I, I went by, and, you know, he took a couple of practice swings, and he stood over the ball, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, he's, t he's taking his time to hit this putt, you know. And all of a sudden when he hit that putt, I said to myself, oh, my God, Jesus Christ. You know, find the hole somehow, otherwise, you know, that ball is off the, off the putting surface. And actually, he missed, the, he missed the, the edge of the hole, and actually, I had to make a, a good eight, nine footer to, to But uh, you win. did. Yes, I did. And he, well, he, uh, was, oh, he was as happy or happier than you. Yes, yes. It was a, a, a big relief for him. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Many of us remember the con conclusion of the Muirfield Village match and many of us I think had tears in our eyes but not you because as I think then the baby of the side <laughs> you decided you would practice beautiful dancing steps on Jack's hallowed 18th green now they might have been running at 13 and a half or 14 feet on the stump but it didn't stop you doing your jive did it <laughs> well, I have to say when I see those pictures you know I'm ashamed of myself <laughs> <laughs> no I think it uh, I think for everyone, including even our American friends, I think they realized what it meant to our yeah, team, lot, yeah. to our tour, and, and indeed to Europe. And of course, it continued the great run that the boys had started at, yeah. at the Belfry. Moving off the Ryder Cup for a moment, mentioned last night to you, starting with a 61. Yeah. We go forward, I think, to 1990. Yeah. Jose goes to Firestone for the World Series of Golf one of America's biggest titles and, and now a World Golf Championship. And I think the scores at Firestone, I don't know if, if many of you have been able to recall them, but his opening round was 61 and he followed with three 67s, Seven. winning by 12 shots from mm -hmm. Lanny Watkins. True. Tell us about that zone. Well, I think, uh, you know, when, when I look back uh, to my career, I have to say that maybe uh, that was the week where I played my best golf. Uh, no questions about that. Uh, uh, prior to getting there, um, uh, Ben Stewart and some of the top players in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, told me that, you know, if I was going to play that event, and I said yes, and, and they said, well, this is the toughest golf course we play all year long. You know, it's a, a traditional... Uh, three-line course, you know, with very fast greens, and, 
and the winning score usually you know is around three four five under par and maybe three or four guys just break par uh, in the whole week and so on so okay I said fine good so I got there and uh, had a pra couple of practice rounds and uh, I have to say that the week before I was hitting the driver all over the park I promise you uh, uh, we were playing in Denver uh, Colorado and on the last day, I was so pissed off you know, <laughs> that you know, I decided, because of the altitude, you know, with my self team the ball so low, I couldn't you know, make any distance or anything. So I decided you know, to really tee the ball up high and hit it up. And uh, I kept that idea with the driver uh, during that week. And uh, it's true that I used a lot the one iron uh, on that golf course. There were certain part four that they were very tight, and I used the, the one iron quite often also. And uh, I started with a fantastic round. Uh, and the way I started, it was amazing. I mean, I birdied the first hole, eagled the second hole, birdied the third, and birdied the fourth. So I was five under par after four holes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, OK, well, this is the toughest course in the United States. I'm doing quite well, you know. You know but, and, uh, and I kept on playing pretty solidly, and uh, I had a, a, a beautiful birdie chance on, on 15, the par 3, from within 6, 7 feet after hitting a lovely 2 iron. <coughs> uh, another birdie chance on 16 and 17, didn't convert, but managed to shoot 61. And then, uh, uh, as you said, I shot 367s, uh, but funny enough, I started every day uh, on those three days, birdie, birdie, on number one and every two, day. every day. So uh, it's true that uh, the night uh, prior to the last round on Saturday, um, I didn't sleep at all. Uh, you know, I had seven shots uh, cushion. It was the first time for me uh, in the States that I had that cushion. And uh, I knew in a way that it was uh, my tournament to lose. lose. And I wasn't really, you know, comfortable in, in that situation, and I didn't sleep very well. Uh, I was playing with Hell Irwin the last day on Sunday. And uh, um, luckily for me, as I said, I started Verdi Verdi, and then he started Bogey Par. So all of a sudden, you know, I had yeah. a, a, even a bigger yeah. cushion, cushion, and I played uh, really solid that week, but uh, I managed to win, as you said, by 12. Uh, but I have to say that uh, when I look back, uh, uh, I've had great events, uh, won uh, many events, but uh, I think that week was the, the purest I stroke the ball in my career. I can tell you that it, <clears throat> I shared with uh, Ollie last evening the fact that one of our great writers, when print was uh, huge, was attending that World Series and was following Jose most of his journey. And he was overhearing an American supporter lamenting the fact that Firestone had been losing trees and it wasn't quite what it had been. And this uh, gentleman, the, the late great Norman Mayer, stopped him and said, Sir, to in any way, in any way protect the golf course this week from Jose, these trees would have needed to be in the middle of every fairway. <laughs> That's, I think, how well you played that week. Yeah. And I think for you to agree that it of all of the achievements, and we'll come on to Augusta, I think, in a moment, I think that must have been. I don't think anyone's going to shoot 262 at Firestone. Well, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's really it's a difficult, difficult golf course. It's very tight. Uh, nowadays, it's true that uh, with uh, the new generation of players that hit the ball so far and, and so And straight, the equipment, probably. Well, true, yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, the equipment uh, has helped, but... Uh, uh, personally, I wouldn't take away anything from, from the players these days. I no. mean, they really uh, dedicate themselves uh, uh, in a way that uh, we didn't in those days. Right. Uh, they spend a lot of time in the gym, uh, working hard, trying to get a stronger, fitter, uh, having, trying to create more uh, club head speed and so on. Uh, all, all due respect to that, I think it's a golf course still that uh, is a great challenge. Um, and it's going to be difficult to, to see that 61, uh, you know, uh, broke. Uh, I think not in our time. Well, I've learned one thing in golf that, uh, never you know. Never say never. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll come on to miracles later, but 
I think now our audience would like us to move on to what I believe, and I think we all believe, is a love affair that you've had with Augusta mm -hmm. over many, many years. Yeah. And we know that in 94 and 99 you claimed the green jacket. But I really think in 91, yeah. when you went second to Woozy, on a day when all of us supporting the Euros simply wanted either Jose or Woozy to finish ahead of Tom Watson or Lanny Watkins. And uh, a number of us who had the privilege of being there were quietly confident that one of you would do so. And on that day, Woozy hold the putt on yeah. the last to defeat you. But would it be fair to say that you really knew then that you were going to come back soon and when? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, um, there is an incident uh, when, when everything was over and done. Uh, Sergio is here, uh, who's uh, been with me all my career, and uh, and uh, he and uh, his wife in those days. Uh, uh, when when I finished play uh, 18, mm -hmm. I, we walked onto the clubhouse, and uh, mm, they were pretty much in tears. And uh, uh, I look at them and, and told them, uh, "You shouldn't be in tears because today I proved myself that I will have a chance to win a major." And uh, sooner or later it will happen. So only three years. Yeah, and uh, that's how uh, important it was. Even though I finished second uh, to Woozy that year, uh, it gave me uh, uh, enough self-belief that uh, I would have other chances to uh, to win a major event. Uh, and uh, that's what I learned from that. And I was I was very positive, even though I finished second uh, to Woozy the idea that uh, you know, sooner or later I will, I will have another chance to, to win a major. Am I maybe getting it wrong, or was that the year when you did finish second by only one shot? Did you take six on the sixth? I took actually seven. On the par three? On the par three, yeah. I thought it was six. Yeah, it was the highest score on the par three uh, on that whole Was story. it that year? Yeah. So you lost the Masters? Yeah. Jose lost the Masters yeah. by a shot yeah. with a quadruple Correct. on the sixth hole. I kept on chipping, you know. I, you know, I, I'm so king of, of chipping that, you know, I said, okay, you know. Must have I'm, I'm going to keep on chipping around it this It must have been a pretty <laughs> difficult chip. There's not many who've chipped better than, than yourself, but I wondered if it was that year. I knew one year yeah. I was out there, yeah. and I, I thought it was six. It was yeah. seven. It was seven, yeah. And lost by one. Yeah. But fast forward three years. I think you went into that final round one behind, yeah. but you uh, you got the job done and and brilliantly. Yes, uh, I was uh, um, a week that didn't start well. Um, I was coming uh, from playing a couple of events really well, and I was really confident about my game. I was really happy with it at least, and I remember that the first day. Uh, I didn't perform well, I shot over par, uh, I was really upset with myself and usually when, when I finish a round I go um, uh, to the drain range to loosen up and you know, I clear my mind a little bit and all that and uh, I was so upset with myself that actually I took off, I, you know, I, I took the clubs, uh, you know, I drove to the house that I hired for the week, and I was really thinking to myself, I mean, bloody hell, <laughs> you know, I've been hitting the ball well, I've been scoring well, uh, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I come to a place that I really feel comfortable on, and everything went, you know, uh, the wrong way. Uh, well, I mean, we had dinner, and I woke up the following morning, and, you know, uh, I went there uh, with no expectations, to be honest, uh, after, you know, uh, the bad round on the first day, but uh, everything clicked again, and uh, I managed to uh, put uh, uh, three decent scores mm -hmm. at, <coughs> at the rest of the week, and I managed to win the tournament. Uh, there were a couple of key moments. Uh, maybe the the most important one I would say was the 15th hole. Uh, I took my gamble with my second shot. I hit a good drive off the tee, and I was in between clubs. The greens were really, really hard. Uh, they were like concrete, uh, and the flag was pretty much in the middle of the green. 
uh, well, straight in the middle, but close to the back edge. And I knew that if uh, if you hit it over the green, uh, I mean, your chances for, for burning the hole would be very slim. So I took a gamble. I was, you know, between clubs four and five. And I said uh, to Dave, I said, Dave, yeah, give me the five and I'm going to go for it. Uh, I'm going to hit it as hard as I can. If I hit it good, I think it should be good enough to, to carry the water. Uh, and uh, I hit it lovely. Uh, and I thought when I hit it that it was going to pitch like a good three, four yards inside the green. And actually the ball pitched on the very edge of the green and uh, just reached the flat area, not, not on the green, but just really reached the flat area in the front part of the green and the ball stayed on top and uh, obviously I knocked that putt uh, for Eagle, which was a long putt, I would say uh, a good 40, 45 feet, something like that. Uh, and uh, Tom Lehman had hit um, a lovely second shot uh, just over the flag about uh, eight, nine feet, hit a lovely putt, the ball touched the right edge of the hole and stayed away and uh, that was a key moment there. Yes. Uh, yeah and then managed to to close the deal. Uh, I had a couple of shots uh, playing 18 uh, and I remember I remember uh, when I was uh, walking from the 17th tee, 17th green uh, to the 18th tee what uh, Sevi told me uh, regarding uh, 91 that yes. we just talked about. Uh, in 91 I was playing in the second last group of uh, and Tom uh, uh, sorry, uh, Tom, yeah, Tom Watson and Woozy, they were playing in the final group. And I hit a driver off the tee thinking that I needed a birdie on the 18th to, to uh, really win the tournament. Uh, we were level uh, at that time. Uh, we were all in the same score. And uh, when everything was over, uh, a couple of weeks later, Sebi approached me and said, why did you hit the driver on 18? And I said, Sebi, you know, I mean, you know, I thought I needed a birdie to play 18, uh, to, to win the tournament. And, uh, you know, I was really feeling comfortable uh, with that shape from left to right on that hole. Uh, and he said to me, uh, remember the next time you have, you are in that position, let the other guys make a birdie. You just make a par. And that's oh, a tough hole. And yeah. we'll see what happens. So uh, when, I, when I was walking from 17th to, to the 18th uh, tee, I remember those words. And I took an, uh, an iron off the tee on 18. Uh, it's true that it was the, the winds were coming from the southwest, which is helping <coughs> off, off the yes. tee on, on 18, and I made the decision a little bit easier and uh, kept the ball in play uh, off the tee. And even though then I pulled my second shot a little bit to the left, I what had did you need? What iron did you need for seven iron? Seven. Well, completely different nowadays. You know, I can yes. hit a driver now the best I can, and it's a three iron onto the ground. So <laughs> <laughs> the hole has changed. One a bit. iron, seven iron. Yeah, it was a one iron and a seven iron. And then, uh, <coughs> uh, as I said, I had a two shots cushion and I chipped and put uh, up and down for, for par and, and won the event. And you had the green yeah, well, jacket slipped on, jacket. joining yeah. your other European colleagues in a famous photograph that I know made George O'Grady's uh, mantelpiece at Wentworth for many years. And would I be right in thinking, a month or so later, you made George's year because... You came to Wentworth, I think, Correct. and won the PJ Championship, yes, which uh, owes much today to be still the flagship of the European Tour that, if I may say, with George being here, he made the tournament, uh, he made the stage yes. for yourselves, and he, nothing pleased him more than when a Masters champion came back and won at Wentworth, and you did. And it pleased me a lot because uh, I have to say, as, as you said, Ken, being the flagship of, uh, of our tour, uh, it was an event that uh, I was really eager to win. And uh, when it happened, uh, it, was, uh, it was a fantastic moment, I have yeah. to say, winning in, at Wentworth. It was, it was great. Three months later, you went back and conquered America again, didn't you? Yes. Because you went back and... Was it on the other course at first? It was or? correct. It was uh, the North. Correct. It was in on the yes. North course, yeah. yeah. And you won the World Series again. But I think if we stay on the Masters theme, in 99, I confessed to you last night, and I've mm. been speaking with Sergio again uh, today, that uh, George and I had an unwritten rule of ourselves that we would never knowingly make eye contact or speak to our players 
in contention in tournaments. Indeed, any of them going to the first tee, that was their workplace. But on the final day at Augusta in 99, I happened to be sitting with, uh, with Sergio, Sergio outside the clubhouse and uh, waiting. Sergio had obviously been waiting for Jose to come out and I was chatting with them and the great man appeared and I, I broke that rule because we made eye contact and I mumbled, I think, something like, good luck today, Jose. Now, Jose did not really say anything, but he did two things. He stopped briefly and he smiled. Not the great Muirfield Village <laughs> dancing smile, but just enough smile. And I don't know if you still had steel spikes in 99, but he was on concrete. And that smile was accompanied by him tapping his spikes on the concrete as if he knew something that uh, Davis Love and Greg Norman didn't. <laughs> and you were protecting a one-shot lead. Yes. And these were two titans. Yeah. Uh, and also themselves great uh, champions, major champions, desperately trying to get their yes. hands on their first green jacket. But again, you didn't. And did the 15th hole not have another huge part to play? Well, 13th was the... 13th. 13, 13 was in this case, but... Uh, I didn't start uh, extremely well that day. I bogeyed uh, uh, four, five, and six in a row. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, I was like four shots behind. And uh, I said to my caddy, well, we need to do something really quick. We need uh, to make a couple of birdies really quick and, and uh, put ourselves back in, in the mix. And uh, rightly so, I did so, uh, seven, eight. And uh, everything was tight. And we got to the 13th hole, and uh, I was never uh, a great driver of the ball, and, uh, and especially if I had to draw the ball with the driver, you know, that I had serious uh, uh, problems. Uh, and 13th, I never felt comfortable on that tee box. Uh, and uh, I pushed my tee shot uh, right into the, the pine. Uh, on the corner? Correct, on the corner, on the right-hand side. And uh, Greg hit a lovely tee shot with a nice little draw, high draw. He was really uh, f a fantastic driver of the ball. So I, all I could do was just chip it out and give myself a, a hundred or 110 yard shot onto the flag. The flag was cut on the right uh, back, uh, right corner. Yeah. And uh, Greg went for the green, uh, hit a lovely shot. Um, I would say about 18 feet, something like that. And I ch my, my third shot was okay, it was not all that great. Uh, I pulled it a bit left and I left myself like a 15 footer or so. And uh, Norman uh, hit his putt, actually knocked it in uh, for eagle. And at that time I was two, two strokes ahead. And if I didn't make that putt, obviously the, the, we were both uh, tied. And the noise on that hole, I promise you, it was, it was huge. It was really loud. Uh, crowds went crazy. They, they really wanted uh, uh, Greg to win the, the Masters. And uh, um, I have to say, uh, in total honesty, that uh, uh, that's one of the moments uh, I will cherish uh, for the rest of my career. Yeah. Because instead of uh, me uh, getting a little bit anxious or nervous, uh, uh, my thinking process was at that time was it doesn't get any better than this. When the when the crowds were you know uh, clapping and shouting before I hit my putt, and uh, fun enough I went uh, I stood over my my putt and knocked it in, uh, and I kept that uh, shot uh, lead yeah. ahead. And as, as I was walking uh, towards the 14th, uh, Greg was waiting on the edge of the green, and he pointed at me, and I pointed at him uh, with all, all due respect to, to both of us, of what we, we did. And uh, uh, after that, he, missed, uh, he made a couple of mistakes on 14 and 15. Uh, but then uh, Davis uh, mm -hmm. came back and chipped it in uh, from the left of, on 16 when I was standing on the, on the 15th green. And, uh, you know, things were tight again. And I have to say that on that 16th hole, I'm most probably I hit my best six iron. Uh, yeah. 
I put it really close and uh, make birdie and uh, kept that uh, two shot cushion uh, to the very end and managed to win the tournament. I think the, those insights are phenomenal now through all of the 90s and I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if Sergio has uh, again turned me in on my confessions. But one of the reasons George and I would sit with Sergio most days is because you may know that a gentleman back in England was keeping a very, very close eye on, on your progress. Our mentor, our former president of the PJs okay, of Europe, John, uh, John Jacobs. John. And I want to come on to that now because I think a lot of us here really want to know how a stubborn Yorkshireman, which John was, <laughs> and a stubborn Basque, which you most certainly are, he loved you as his own son. Yeah. And the relationship was based over many, many, many years. years yeah. And do you know, he would, we had to ring John, because we would see him before we left London. He would instruct us to ring him. He'd be watching the telecast, and he would think that he could influence your play from deep in, in the southern England, if one of us were brave enough to go and say to Sergio, Please tell Ollie to get the ball back a little bit, or <laughs> forward a little bit. Correct, Sergio? And occasionally, we would pluck up courage. Now, I suspect Sergio never came anywhere near you with these views, but that was how John felt. Please tell us about well, the special relationship. Yeah, the relationship with John was very special. Uh, he, was a, he was a true character. And uh, I first met him when I was a teenager. I was uh, 14 years old and the Spanish Federation organized uh, uh, teaching, uh, you know, young kids and, and uh, actually the, uh, the, the Spanish professionals uh, with, uh, with John, actually, you know. Uh, and I went to Madrid, first time ever. Um, uh, Puerta de Hierro was, uh, yeah. was uh, the club and uh, we uh, uh, the, the process was that all the, the Spanish professionals were there uh, following uh, John's uh, instructions and how to do things and, and how to change things and so on. And then certain amateurs would go out there and, and hit a few shots and then he would uh, explain what, uh, yeah. what he saw and, and pass that information to the professionals and so on. And, and that's the first time I met him. And, uh, uh, from the very beginning, uh, you know, there was a certain chemistry uh, yeah. uh, between the two of us. And that relationship uh, uh, stayed, uh, actually grew up uh, as years went by. And I spent a lot of time with John, actually going to Wentworth uh, yeah. uh, to see him and, and to practice with him. And he was, uh, he was a man that kept uh, things uh, pretty simple. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's what I liked about uh, John. Uh, when teaching uh, any professional, it, it didn't matter, uh, you know, the, the, the size of the player, uh, how the characteristics of, of his swing, he tried to keep everything simple and adjust uh, uh, his knowledge to uh, the player's swing. And in that regard, I think he was a, he was a fantastic uh, teacher, and uh, we, we learned a lot, uh, not just myself, but I think most of our, uh, our Spanish professionals uh, learn a lot from him, and that uh, knowledge has been passed through the years uh, to, to our generations, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a fantastic man. He did a lot, a lot for the European Tour, uh, and uh, it's, it's sad that uh, you know, he's not with us, but uh, uh, he was a great man. And when he was no longer quite fit enough to travel, yeah. I think he decided that maybe you should go to another great man who was a yeah. great friend of John's and, and of golf, and that, of course, is Butch Harmon. Yeah, yeah the thing is that uh, because uh, he wasn't able to, uh, to travel anymore and uh, you know, we didn't have uh, as much time as we used to, uh, I actually asked him, uh, John, uh, listen, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have, we don't spend enough time uh, uh, working together and uh, um, I want to uh, hear from you uh, what I should do or who I should um, uh, see 
and uh, he never hesitated. He, the answer was a straight, uh, a straightforward. Uh, I think you should go and see Butch. Uh, he is. Uh, he has learned from from you know uh, from the old school from his yes. father, and he has followed uh, pretty much uh, our uh, line of uh, yes. of teaching. And I think uh, you should go uh, and see him, and that's that's what I did. And that worked as well. Yeah, it worked as well. Yeah, it worked really well. Tell us a little bit about the most disappointing call you may have had to make to Bernard Gallagher in '95, yeah, when injury and illness meant you couldn't go yeah. on Bernard's final team at Oak Hill. Yeah, at the end of at the end of '94, uh, actually in the winter of. Of 94 to 95, I started to have some issues with my feet, uh, and uh, I didn't know what to do, to be honest. And uh, I got surgery done, uh, trying to relieve the pain. Uh, and uh, I started the season in 95, and as the season progressed, uh, the pain still uh, was there, and uh, didn't allow me to uh, practice uh, properly and. Uh, it got to a point where um, I could barely finish 18 holes. Uh, um, you could see that in the results. Usually I started the round decently or even under par, and whenever I go to the 13th, 14th hole on, uh, I just couldn't walk, couldn't swing the club, and ended up always you know, with, with bad scores uh, uh, on the last few holes. And uh, it, was, uh, it was the Ryder Cup year, and... Uh, um, in this case, uh, Bernard told me that uh, uh, you know you have a spot if you want to uh, in the team. Uh, but I said to him, "Okay, let me play another couple of events and, yeah. and see how how I feel, uh, and I will give you a call." And so uh, I, I remember, you know, I I was in such pain uh, the playing the last few holes that I actually had to pick up the phone and call and, and tell him. And told him that you know I, I had to uh, yeah. uh, to give my spot. Uh, it would it would have been completely unfair for me to to be part of that team, knowing that, uh, uh, especially being a Ryder Cup, uh, the Ryder Cup event where you have to play most probably yeah. 36 holes on Friday and Saturday, to uh, to be part of that team, knowing that I, I couldn't perform to uh, to the standard. So uh, that was a, a tough call. Um, uh, but the great but thing is you came back. Yes. And you were back yeah. winning again, I think, in the Tour Espana series the yes. next, next year uh, and in time to play for Captain Seve. Yes, correct. Uh, I, I stopped playing uh, September uh, 95, didn't play the whole of 96. Um, I went to see a doctor in Germany. Uh, somehow he he put me back on track and he told me that uh, I wouldn't be pain free for the following year, but that most probably I would be able to play a few events. Uh, so I took a schedule where I would play like two events and two weeks off so I could give myself enough rest. And, uh, uh, you know, strangely enough, uh, I went to uh, Las Palomas in, in Tenerife, yes. uh, being my third event, I think it was, uh, of the season and managed to win there. You did. Uh, I was in tears on 18, um, remembering all the yeah. all the tough times. Yeah. And uh, uh, but it was a very emotional moment, and uh, managed to make the team uh, for seven. Another winning uh, team. Correct. In '97 at Baldarama, uh, and uh, you know it was it was a great week uh, because uh, for a year, a year and a half, I thought I would never play golf again, and to put myself. Uh, in that team and being able to uh, to win uh, the Ryder Cup uh, at home soil, uh, that was uh, very, very special. Wonderful, wonderful moment for European golf, Jose. I want to leave, if, if you'll permit me, to leave to last the miracle at Medina mm -hmm. for special reason. So in the meantime, tell us about now. You've got exciting plans here with Achilles yeah. and yeah. His, his team here and Achilles is here. You're, the two courses are underway. You have a thriving design business, which is magnificent. This is going to become the most special place, isn't it? Well, I, I, like, I came here two years ago to see the site. 
and I was really impressed of, of the whole area with, uh, with the mountains in the back and, and the bay area uh, in front there. Uh, you have, uh, you know, two golf courses that, uh, you know, uh, have wonderful sceneries uh, by the bay. Uh, but when we went all the way to the top of the hill there, it was all, it's, well, still it's all bushes and, and, you know, all kind of plants and things like that. But we made our way to uh, pretty much to the edge of the cliff uh, of, the, of the property. And uh, uh, the view uh, that I saw, it was just uh, breathtaking. You can see the whole bay area, the entrance of the bay uh, with the mountains in your back and, you know, um, uh, I, fall, I fell in love with the place, uh, and I think we're going to have uh, two uh, more great golf courses in the area here. Uh, the goal is to have uh, a golf destination uh, in Greece. Uh, we do have pretty much all the elements. Uh, yeah. Food is good, weather is nice, uh, facilities are going to be great. So in that regard, I think we can, we can create here a, a golf destination. I'm, I'm very eager to... Uh, to see the whole thing uh, finished uh, in two or three years time. And uh, well, uh, it will be up to the players that come here and play to, to decide if it's uh, worth it or not. But uh, I can assure you that uh, the scenery is breathtaking from the top there. I think everybody here wants you to play in a Greek Senior Open or Masters here on your golf course. That would be and great. Still, <laughs> and still win. <laughs> because I think we, as long as you can be fit, yeah. I don't think any of us would put that past you. Now, and we have the PGA of Spain here. I think you are happy that the PGA of Spain is now playing a really prominent part yeah. within the PGAs of Europe, which we think is appropriate. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure the fellas have your total support. Yes, uh, I have to say that uh, I was uh, talking to Ian uh, last night and... Uh, I think uh, the Spanish PGA is doing a, a great thing. Uh, things have changed uh, from the last uh, presidency. Uh, I think they are uh, making huge efforts uh, to to build uh, new relationships uh, and to promote uh, the game of golf uh, at all levels. And in that regard, they, they know they have all my support. And uh, hopefully we will uh, keep on going in that direction for a long time. We need a new armada. <laughs> to join what Seve, yourself, Pinero, yeah. Rivero, Canizares yeah. and all the guys did. And now, of course, Sergio Garcia and John yeah. Ram and others are going to continue. Yeah. We've been very fortunate in that regard. I, I, think, yeah. uh, I think you've made your own fortune by yeah. wonderful talent, wonderful determination, and above all, a commitment to excellence. And I think if we can move on now to the miracle at Medina, what I'd like to do, if I may, because I was just a, a little pundit looking in from the outside. But we have here George O'Grady, Andy and Randall, who were on the inside because they were very much uh, running the European effort, if you like, outside of the captain and his 12 men. And I think, George, if you and Ian would take Ollie through the happenings of that uh, momentous week in, in, um, in uh, just outside Chicago. <laughs> in the United Kingdom see the miracle of Medina. It's played on the sky, a thing that a company called Pitch International put together. So we've seen your interview, I've seen your interview, and I was lucky enough to watch the, uh, uh, the final shot on the 18th screen with the boss of Sky Television. Into it. And he, and he, when he had it against me, because I said to him, sorry, babe, I haven't charged you enough for this now. <laughs> but you tell me just what it meant to you for that uh, almost from the beginning of the week to be bluntly outplayed on Friday, Friday morning certainly, and then to come back to make it a miracle because it was, I think you live very infrequently in one's life watching to go through something like that. It was just, to use the phrase, lucky to be there. It was your, yeah. your moment and it's very special. Well, it was a very special moment for me, obviously, George, uh, for different reasons. Uh, uh, first and most important one was because it was the first time that Sevi was not with us. Mm, he passed away uh, the year before, and 
uh, I somehow I wanted uh, a service spirit in the team and I talked to the family uh, and we managed to uh, have a service logo in the sweaters and the shirts and, and in the bag. Uh, that, was, uh, that was really special. Uh, but, but the whole week um, I was really confident that uh, we had a very strong team. Uh, good enough to beat uh, the Americans in, in their home soil. Uh, the golf course, the way it was set up, obviously was favoring uh, the U.S., but, uh, you know, uh, we had a very strong team uh, with players playing really well, and it's true that I didn't expect um, uh, to lose uh, the way we did on Friday, uh, we struggled big time on Saturday to keep that difference uh, and uh, the reaction that uh, certain players had on that Saturday, uh, it was, it was uh, fantastic, unbelievable, very difficult to describe in words. Uh, it's something that, uh, that happens on the golf course and it transpires to, to each other player in the team, uh, the way Ian um, performed. Uh, on that uh, Saturday afternoon was crucial. The way he celebrated uh, that part on 18 was the key. Uh, when he turned around on the 18th green after making that part and looked at the rest of the team that was waiting just on the edge of the green, uh, the way he celebrated uh, that moment, uh, looking at, at those players, uh, it transpired to the team. And when we had that uh, meeting on Saturday night, uh, I have to say that even though we were four points behind, uh, it, it felt like we were almost ahead, uh, to be honest. I mean, it's hard to explain this, but uh, when you talk to a player, when you look at uh, a player in the eye, uh, when, you th when you talk about what it is to come on, on that Sunday, uh, what, what you have to really achieve and do, uh, uh, and you see that look in the eyes with no um, hesitation, no doubts, no fear. And when you see that spark, you start to believe that it, it is possible. Um, and that's why I asked them uh, to play with no fear, uh, to go for every shot, uh, that we had nothing to lose. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I have to take my hat off to those 12 men because uh, what they did was uh, truly special. I mean, we, we won uh, that Ryder Cup and uh, I was captain of, of the team, but uh, all I want that all credit goes to, to those 12 players because they never stopped believing. Uh, they, they kept on fighting that Sunday like it was the last day of their lives. And uh, I think that that combination uh, made us win that, uh, that Ryder Cup. Well, I think to everybody who was there, uh, you are the, the record book show, you're the ultimate Ryder Cup player. But that was the ultimate Ryder Cup team where the team spirit was so strong, and especially when you faced the first uh, Friday morning and that belief that you engendered, uh, and everybody felt it throughout, I think. It's, uh, that's what I mean, your great playing career or the captaincy you can't get rid of the playing career, but that captaincy that week, that miracle, must have given you enormous satisfaction for the yeah. rest of your life. Yes, I mean, as, as an individual, obviously, mayors are, are the ones that determine your, uh, your career. Uh, no questions about that. But uh, as uh, uh, sentimental victories and special victories, uh, that is number one. Uh, no questions about that. Uh, um, as captain, you know nowadays that you only have one shot uh, um, to be captain of the European uh, team. Um, and it's pretty much all or nothing that week. Uh, there is no gray areas. It's, it's either black or white. Uh, you know that if you win, you might be the, the best captain of, of the history of the Ryder Cup. And if you lose, I mean, you could be the worst captain in the, in the history of the, of the Ryder Cup. But, uh, uh, you know, having all those elements, uh, realizing that that's, that's a fact of the Ryder Cup, uh, and on top of that, uh, um, 
the emotions that uh, were uh, very vivid uh, about Sevi. Uh, we, we had a, a video of him uh, that we saw, and uh, you know, all those things together made that that week uh, very special in my career. And as I said, I mean, sentimentally. Um, by far, uh, that's the biggest ever victory that uh, that I have in my career. Well, from a personal point of view, to accept this award uh, and to receive it this evening from the PGAs of Europe, uh, to recognise these achievements, crowned with a great team achievement, what others have done, on top of your own phenomenal career, would I think make everybody in the PGA of Europe who's here tonight. Uh, Immensely proud. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. Jose Maria Latabal.